Okay, how many of you have seen a cyclone? A few of you? Um, I can guarantee you all have seen one. It's just you may not have put, put it together. Almost any plant that you've dri driven past, you will see one or more cyclones. So you're driving out along the, 40, uh, the QEW to Niagara, you'll pass Bartek. Bartek has several prominent cyclones on top of their, their building. Any of the major plants, you will see cyclones. They're used for treating air to remove dust and small <coughs> particles before it's discharged to the atmosphere. Uh, home vacuum cleaners made by Dyson, they all have uh, a number of cyclones in them, often six or eight cyclones. So you've likely seen these devices, and they always have this shape where it's fairly characteristic of them, a vertical uh, piece there, and then a, a taper down to the discharge point. And there's, in fact, there's two discharges. There's a feed here on the side, and I'll show you a bit more on that in a minute. And then there's the, what we call the overflow discharge and the underflow. So one entry point and, and two exits. There's internal to the overflow. As we follow the overflow inwards, in fact, it comes in. So it's, it's more of it. To this shape. Inside, that pipe keeps going internal to the unit. And this is called the vortex finder. Just that region inside is known as the vortex finder. And you'll see why it's called that in a minute. And so you may have seen them looking like that. So there's my feed coming in. It gets taken up to the, sorry, in this one, it's, the feed comes in over here. Feed comes in over here. There's a spiral part. This is my overflow coming over and then back down again to the ground level. And my underflow is being discharged here into a hopper. And the reason why I'm pretty sure you've seen them is because they're used all over. Um, most commonly where you see them is in, on sawmills and in any material industry that's processing fine dusts or powders. <coughs> they're also used though in the petroleum industry to recover catalyst particles that are circulating around. So for example, in a fluidized bed reactor, um, those catalyst particles need to be recovered and recycled. And a cyclone is an excellent way to recover those particles without damaging them. If you need to remove small droplets of moisture or water um, or mists, fine mists from an from a air stream or a gas stream, or small particles, so, so like milk powder or particles like lab chemicals that are created and spray dried in an atomizer, those are removed and recovered from the, the air stream in cyclones often. What's interesting is that it's not just for solid fluid separation, as I've discussed up here, but we can also use a cyclone to separate two liquids of different densities. So here again, the key principle of a cyclone is sedimentation. Sometimes people call cyclones just a centrifugal sedimentation vessel. Okay? So it's a sedimentation vessel that we're applying a centrifugal force to to recover our, our our two streams, and those streams could be two liquids of different densities, or they could be a solid and a liquid, or a liquid and a gas. Okay. We'll often use a cyclone to dewater suspension, um, or remove dissolved gases even from a liquid stream. But the most common is definitely solids separation from, from a fluid, whether that fluid is liquid or gas. Okay. Now, the thing you should, when you're looking in this course, is, is we're looking at a number of these units. So we've covered four or five different separation units already in this class. Well, one thing to ask yourself is, how do I know when to pick a, a cyclone, say, from a sedimentation vessel, say, from a centrifuge? They, they all have different uses. Can you think of a reason or two why you would pick a cyclone rather than a centrifuge? So you've, you've seen the topic of centrifuges. Here's a cyclone. You've got a rough idea of what's going on here now. Why might you choose a cyclone instead of a centrifuge? Joseph? Uh, maybe it's better for continuous use. Like centrifuge, you get to spring the thing 
Okay, so centrifuges have that batch operation. What if it was a centrifuge that had that sort of continual solids discharge? Then what, what's your disadvantage? Okay, but good, good, good line of thinking. <coughs> the volumetric throughput could be a lot higher with cyclones. Yeah, sure. Much cheaper to operate. Why is that? You're not spinning anything. Helen, yeah? You're not spinning anything. There's no moving parts in there, right? You're not accelerating a bowl and keeping that moving. It's the fluid and the feed, I should say, coming in that's doing the separation for itself. So what is your ESA? If we're not spinning anything, this unit is just stood, sitting here static, there's no motor there. What, energy, what is my energy separating agent? Okay, I'll disregard gravity, we'll talk why, but it's the, the feed itself, the pressure difference or the momentum through there, you have to accelerate that feed into the device, have it spin around and then come out, okay? So the ESA is the feed itself. Now, there's a number of alternatives we could consider with, um, with solid fluid separation. So particularly for dust separation, I'd asked you in the first assignment, which um, I'm going to return to you up front here today. But in that first assignment, you had looked at a number of ways of separating a, a solid from a fluid. And many of you came up with some creative suggestions. And here's another one, if you haven't seen it. This is by applying baffles, we can break the momentum of the solids relative to the fluid. And then the solids will drop out here at the bottom. Right? So a cyclone has a similar principle, where we're using the momentum difference in the solid versus the fluid. Okay, so before I go ahead and just describe this slide, maybe I'll just jump to the videos because it's really, it's complex what the, f the flow patterns look like inside these units. So let me perhaps start with this, um, with this slide. Now, we can really start this slide anywhere because it's four minutes of just this spinning around. But let me explain to you what they've done here. This is an actual cyclone and they've put a particle in the cyclone that is radioactive, and then around the cyclone, they've got the imaging device to pick up where that particle's location is over time. Okay, this video is four minutes long. I've got the link posted online, but it's four minutes <coughs> of stretched out. This is actually three seconds in real time. Okay, so this is the shape of that particle coming in and it's spiraling around. And notice it doesn't just spiral in one direction and leave. It can travel along the cyclone. Okay, so this is a cyclone lying on its side. It's not vertically oriented as in the previous pictures. And you can see that there's a residence time inside the cyclone. And eventually that particle may choose to leave out the bottom of the cyclone in the underflow, or it might leave in the overflow. So there's one, one video. Let's take a look at another one. <clears throat> okay, so let me just uh, pause this one here at this moment and just explain to you what's going on. With these cyclones, because the fluid patterns in the cyclone are so complex, there's no theoretical equations that we can derive what those, what those particles will, will do. Uh, we do know that they will follow the Navier-Stokes equations. So what, the, what these simulators have gone and done is someone's taken this many particles, 35,000 odd particles, ranging in size between 20 and microns and 10 millimeters. And they've put them in a cyclone that's probably the height of this room, so 18 meters and 4 meters diameter and at that inlet velocity. And what you're going to see here is the trajectory that those, those particles take. So this is a simulation of them. So they're coming there in a batch. Now the heavier particles are in red, and you're going to see them move towards the bottom. The smaller particles are in lighter blue, and they head to the top. So let me just uh, 
pause there again. So I want to emphasize that you saw there it was a batch of 35,000 particles coming in. In practice, though, there's a continual feed of particles coming in and continual leaving at the top and continual leaving at the bottom. Just for the simulation, though, they just track that discrete batch of particles. And so you'll see your finer particles leave out there at the top. And in fact, here in the simulation, they just leave them accumulating and circulating. But in fact, they will actually find their way into the vortex finder and go out the overflow. It's so just for the simulation, they keep them there to keep track of them. And your larger particles, or your coarse particles as we call them, they circulate and, and travel around at the bottom. Okay, so that gives you uh, an idea of those batch of particles. Now what the simulation goes and, goes and does is, I'll just wait for the next piece. Okay, so what the, what the researchers have done here is they've taken particles of 20 microns, small, small particles. And they've drawn the trajectories of about 10 of them in, in these different colors. And here you can see the patterns. So you see a spiraling of them down. And then, so if they're spiraling clockwise, then they get a smaller clockwise profile. And they spiral up and they leave in the overflow. Okay, so that's your fines. And the coarse particles, they'll follow a different path. So we'll see the coarse particles now in a minute. So these are particles that are over 50 micron. They spiral and then leave in the underflow. So that gives you an idea of, of the particle trajectory inside there. OK. so. One of the key ways we can influence the particles' trajectories in that cyclone is with the inlet. So if we're looking at a, at a cross section at the top, so here's my inlet coming in, and our very first spiral starts happening over there. My fluid feeding in, I can adjust the velocity by varying that damper. And we'll, we'll show a bit about that in, a, in the next class. But that's one of our key degrees of freedom to control the, the unit's operation. OK, so there's the video of the, the radioactive isotope <coughs> particle. So just a few, a few key points. Um, no moving parts, no consumable components in this device. It's extremely cheap to fabricate a cyclone. They can be made from a number of materials, metal, plastics, and so the capital cost is extremely low for these. They can be very small. Um, so very small cyclones, one to two centimeters to s separate small flow rates. And then very large cyclones, 10 meters in diameter, are even possible. Now the forces on the particle are substantial. But I do want to emphasize that except for this extremely large cyclone, gravity does not play any role. It is tempting to think that the coarse particles spiraling through here and leaving at the bottom are being pulled out due to gravity. But that's simply not true. You can go turn that unit 180 degrees and it will operate in the same way. The coarse particles will still leave from this side of the cyclone. So gravity plays no role in small to moderate sized cyclones, only in the very large so the sort of 10 meter diameter cyclones with large particles, would that be an issue? So we can ignore gravity. Okay. And there's a number of other interesting videos that I've linked to over there, homemade videos of people experimenting with cyclones in their basements and hobbies and various ways. So, so take a look at those. But um, I would like us to spend the next few minutes understanding the velocity profiles in a cyclone. Understanding this part is um, essential to understanding how we can operate the cyclone. And there's, there's three directions we should be able to, to consider here. There's the vertical direction, that's one. So the vertical direction is this figure. There's the radial direction. And then there's the tangential direction, so sort of in a circular way. Okay, so let's take them one at a time. The, a cyclone is symmetrical. 
in terms of its forces. So if I cut it in half, I can just show one half of the cyclone. And that's what I've done here. So in the vertical direction, we've got velocities that are in the upward direction, primarily in the center. And then we've got velocities in the downward direction with a negative, um, a negative sign along the edge. Along this tapering edge, we've got velocities going downward. And that's, in fact, what, what's pushing the coarse particles out. It's not gravity. It's that velocity in the downward direction. Okay? And there's obviously a point where the velocity sign is negative, and then here is positive. At some particular location, we have a velocity vector that is zero. And that's called the locus of zero vertical velocity, LZVV. And it's just an arbitrary line that you can visually draw if you were just looking at the, visual, at the vertical velocities. Now let's focus on the radial velocity. So this is the velocity pointing from the center outwards. And what that shows is, as expected, is that there's, it's, it's an, really an uncertain region. We're not able to measure that with instrumentation. But we do know that in the radial direction, those velocities get higher and higher just to a point close to the wall. And then those velocities are essentially zero as the particle hits the wall. Okay, so that particle gets accelerated and thrown out towards the wall. And then the final velocity to consider, this one's a little bit um, harder to initially visualize. It's the tangential velocity in the, in the radial direction. And to understand it is, is, looks a little bit weird, this formula. But what it says is that that tangential velocity circulating multiplied by the distance from the center, the radius, raised to an exponent n, that product is constant. Okay, so r to the n is some, some number that varies depending on if you're closer or um, further from the center of the axis. And then multiply that by the velocity. So that indicates then, in fact, that the velocities are really fast at the center and the velocities drop off. So particles circulating in this outer region are circulating at a slower radial velocity. Uh, tangential velocity. Particles in the center are circulating at a faster tangential velocity. So let me show that to you again in a video. Okay, so again, here's a batch of particles that are going to be simulated. And I'd like you to watch the particles closer to the center and their velocity relative to the particles further out. So those particles there versus these particles here. So it gets you an idea of those different velocities. You can then also see these particles moving down. So there's that wall velocity there along the boundary layer. OK, so you can, the complete videos are up on the course website. So I'll let them, I'll leave you to go watch those in your own time. Okay, so the key issue that we, we what I, why I wanted to look at all those velocities is that it's really balancing all those orbits of the spiral patterns that develop and the radial and the tangential velocities that, def, that determine whether a particle leaves out in the overflow versus the underflow. So we have this idea idea though that it's the heavier or the coarse particles that leave out the underflow and it's the light fine particles that leave out in the overflow. If you're doing dust separation though it would be perfect if you got no, no solids leaving in the overflow. But we're always going to get our very fine small micron sized particles in the overflow and our coarser heavier particles in the underflow. So that's um, that's an idea of the cyclone's performance. Let me uh, perhaps ask you to think of it this way. So 
So if coming in here in my feed, there's a distribution of the following. So this would be kilograms per hour. And then this is my particle size, micrometers. So that's my feed incoming distribution, particle size distribution. Superimpose on the same plot over here what the particle size distribution would be leaving in the overflow in one color or in one line, one type of line, and then superimpose a second distribution on top of this blue one for the underflow. So you should have three distributions overlaid. And I want you to think carefully this kilograms per hour is telling you something important as well. So, so sketch that. What would be your expectation for that system? Okay, so it's a, any, any suggestions for the overflow? For the overflow, would the distribution be more to this end of the, the drawing or the left side of the axis or to the right side of the axis? Where's the peak of the distribution for the overflow going to be? To the left or the right? Two choices. Yeah. To the left, okay? And this is the mass coming in, right? So we can't have mass of this particular particle size can't be above this line, right? Then you, your mass balance is violated. So if this is the mass coming in, this curve must be below the blue line always, okay? So my overflow might be something like that all the solids of this particular size go out in the overflow, but eventually we're going to get something like that. Okay. Right. So it says up to this particular point, 100% of these particles and smaller, all of those are recovered in your overflow stream. None of them appear in your underflow. Okay. Similarly, these particles down here, almost none of them will appear in your underflow. So let's draw the underflow in a different color. I'll use orange here. Okay, and from a mass balance principle, this must look something like that. Okay, so the blue curve is the sum of the yellow plus the orange. So three particle size distributions are always present in a cyclone. Now you could get away with measuring two out of the three. You obviously just need any two and back calculate the third from a mass balance. Okay, because a mass balance tells us that in equals out, 
there's got to be no accumulation. If you've got accumulation in a cyclone, you've got a big problem. So at steady state, in is always equal to out with zero accumulation if your cyclone is operating properly. Yes, Joseph. Over here, yeah. yeah. So they'll spiral, and, and they also have vertical velocities, and um, so probably notice th that over here, in the vertical velocity, there's some particles going up, but these they're also coming down. Yeah, yeah. So there's they don't get stuck there. Okay. So this this curve shows you this same idea. Your fine particles distribution is skewed <coughs> to the one side. Your coarse distribution is skewed over a little bit further. Um, but this, what this illustration does not show is how the two masses add up. Masses add up in several ways inside a cyclone. Firstly, of course, our total mass, mass n, is equal to the mass of the fines, mf, plus the mass of the coarse. So that, we know that and expect that. But the mass balances also hold within each size fraction. So you'll recall what the size fraction is, of course, is the mass that's within a sliver or basically one of those pans inside the size distribution. <coughs> so the mass distribution also balances. So you can take particles of any particular size fraction, and within that piece over there, the mass of particles corresponding to the orange curve plus the mass of particles corresponding to the yellow curve adds up to the blue. So several mass balances are balancing in, across the cyclone. And we can use those numbers then to calculate what we call an efficiency. Okay. So what I'll do is perhaps just uh, pause over there. But I've got, so here's mi the midterm from last year. The first question was related to this. So I'll hand it out. You can go take a look at question one and two and see if you can answer these sorts of questions related to the mass balancing. I'll just have them pass on there. Can you just take a few more for that group on that? One. So take a minute and try uh, question one. Okay, so what's asked there in the, in the question is that <clears throat> uh, an operator's taken a sample from a process, and I'll just visually illustrate what the question is, is talking about, and you can go um, plug in the numbers and answer it later. But a so to 
you would have from your prior notes, you know that a 450 Tyler mesh corresponds to 32 micron solids. That's pretty much the smallest mesh you can get. Very, very fine uh, dust-like particles. And so we have here a sample taken at 88 kilograms per hour coming in, but of that 17% is what lands up in your analysis on a 450 Tyler mesh. So in other words, 17% of these particles are around the 32 micron particle size. So 88 times 17%, that's equal to 14.96 kilograms per hour of particles of that size. Okay, we also have in the question given that it's in the overflow, similar analysis has been done. And this time, the overhead mass fraction is 52%. Um, and it's 52% of, what's the flow rate here, is 27 kilograms per hour. Okay. Which corresponds then to 14.04. kilograms per hour of that particle size. Okay. Do those numbers look about right? The question's asking, has the operator made, made a mistake? Those numbers. Could they be realistic numbers? Yes. Yeah? Why so? Right, so 14.96 exceeds 14.04, so you haven't created mass there somehow. That the 32 micron size particles are the smallest type of, uh, one of the smallest sizes of solids. We would expect most of them to leave out in the overflow, and the fact that that number 14.04 is so close to 14.96 indicates that. By balance, then, you can calculate that 0.92 kilograms per hour leaving the underflow. And also by balance, you can calculate that this MC, the mass flow rate in the underflow, is 88 minus 27, which is 61 kilograms per hour. Okay. So we just have to measure two out of the three particle, uh, two, two out of the three streams. So what we can go do, and we'll take this up in the class next time, is calculate the grade efficiency for each particle size. But see if you can go ahead and just apply this formula and calculate for yourself and verify the grade efficiency is 6.1%. Okay. So we'll uh, take this up in Tuesday's class. There's also, as I said, the first um, assignment is available up here at the front in paper form for those of you that submitted in paper. The electronic submissions are already returned.